Beardy and the Beast Media Club. This is placeholder intro song. Thanks for joining us here today at the Beardy and the Beast Media Club. My name is Devin, and as always, joining me is the other half of the dreadful duo, Drew. Hey! We will be available on most podcast services, social media platforms. We've got a full list over at our website, beardyofthebeast.com, if you want to check it out. Um, I'm sure you know all the drill. Like, comment, subscribe, mostly. If you like what we do, share it out. Uh, today we'll be discussing the 2012 film Dread, adapted from the British anthology series uh, 2000 AD. Please be aware that vagrant spoilers will not be crushed here, so make sure you check out this film. <laughs> so, Drew, how do you judge Dread? <laughs> well then, uh, I judge it well. No isolation cubes for this movie, I think. Yeah. Which is surprising, given how tropey and stereotypical the movie is and what i mean by this is it seems like a full homage and directly intended to feel and be like those mid to late 80s early 90s like gun action movies mm, yeah no, i can see that um but definitely with more with a serious flair but it knew how to be funny if you're paying attention to it. It's not that, it's not, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger funny or Stallone funny. It's, there's a lot of good one-liners throughout it. And yeah, so, um, so uh, I know I haven't seen the, the 95 Dread. I haven't, I don't know anything about the, the comic series other than it exists. Um, this movie, this is a movie that I'm saddened that I didn't get to see it in theaters. You know what? I I could see that. Like, it it had that you gotta see it on the big screen feel. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I think you can, I, I think you can enter this movie without having um, experienced the comic or even just like the 95 Dread. Um, but specifically the comic, especially given that like, the it was it was written by John Wagner and Carlos uh, Esquera, who also worked on the comics. Yeah. So um, I think that's why it felt like a comic book. It felt, um, and I think it was probably the truest to form that you'd experience. So if you wanted a dread experience, I think that you could watch this movie and receive it. Um, I haven't read the comics myself. I did see the '95 film. But I mean, I was like, yay tall, and by yay tall, I mean like, you know, chin height or whatever. Yeah. I definitely was not a full-grown person at that time. I'm wondering, should I, should I have seen it? All I know is I didn't really catch many of the one-liners. I was really enamored by, like, the visuals of it. Mm. Even it's visually amazing. And it, it, it was really able to distract you from the fact that it wasn't actually that action-packed. You know, you're right. It, it wasn't, but when it was, it really was. Like, the body count in the film is something like 102. Yeah, it was... Right. It definitely but, was in, intense at the points where it needed to be. Yeah. And I, I, th I th you know what? I think this is where um, the directors really shined. Like, a lot of quiet calmness into brutality, just like those moment switches. Yeah. Um, a, a great example of that would be, like, right at the beginning. Mm. The, ser the sereneness um, when, they, when they threw those, um, those men off the building at the beginning as a message. Yeah. That yeah. sereneness of the, the drug-induced slow-mo falling to the brutality of just hitting the pavement. Yeah. Like... That really kind of sets up the action beat and the film style for each of the moments. Very quiet into very intense at a moment's notice. And going the other way around, too. Um, mm. one, one thing that stood out to me was um, uh, when they're, they're fighting in the, the courtyard just before they're trying to get to the med bay to, to hold out. Yeah. Um, again, right after that scene, right after... Um, uh, Anderson is tested by dread. Everything goes silent. The music cut out completely. I'm like, oh, I, I like that, right? It's like you know what happened, and especially where it's such a such a big moment for Anderson, who 
you know, is already barely like she shouldn't be a judge based off of the based off her test scores and aptitude and all of that. But and then Judge uh, Dread testing her, and he's like, no, they tried to kill the judge. You know the law, right? And like it has that impactful moment. Go silent, and you feel that weight of what she had to do, right? And then, of course, she grows throughout the film and starts to understand what she needs to do. Uh, but I, um, well, I'm I'm probably yeah. gonna disagree on that fact with you. But later on, right. um, what I the vi- visually, I was so enamored by this film. Some what is a good point for me when watching this film was the fact that I didn't even notice the music as in it was well adapted. It accentuated the scene Mm. and it was part of the experience. So like I, I didn't know when it cut out, but I had that feeling like I knew that it was silent, even though I had not uh, consciously noticed it. And that's, that's really big for me for um, being absorbed into the film as a whole. Right. A lot, a lot of these shots, I think, like the storyboarding and the planning and the directing were so well done. Like the choices that were made were very well thought out. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, things like um, when they're out in, out in the world and it, the sun's out, it's very oversaturated because they're in a polluted and irradiated environment. Yeah. Um, very, very harsh and static angles everywhere in the film. Mm-hmm. And there was, there was something that I noticed, and I originally thought it was a framing device for when Dredd was talking to Anderson. Mm. Um, whenever they were talking together, they would always be framed in these very harsh, very sharp angle, angles, like very acute. Right. But then later on, I realized um, that was actually an aspect of Anderson. So when she was in a, in a shot something that wasn't a close-up there was almost always some form of like triangle or like harsh pattern behind her and i think this was a way to frame innocence or like her softer features contrasting that against the harsher environment Mm, um even harsher characters yeah just just a lot of a lot of these choices what i'm wondering wondering of of you um do you think that they could have laid up the more questionable ethics of the dreads more, or do you think it would have taken away from the a good the judges? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. For instance, like the very beginning, the chase scene yeah. with dread shoots out the tire, causing the van to flip, which would have put civilians in danger. Yeah. Um, like, do you get that feeling like for that moment, are the judges any worse than the criminals? Do you think they should have played that up or no? That's the opinion that I'm asking. All right. So I, I've got some, some interesting theories, but I think, I think for the most part, um, and this movie is surprisingly subtle in the way it does things. I, mm, I think. I agree. Um, so yes, there's the visuals, but, but like character wise, it is, it's like, try to watch like someone a dancer moving their fingers on stage right it's things that you notice but isn't the the forefront so i honestly think that dread shows that he's not as bad as the criminals in so many ways um he almost never acts in in that way until it's been pushed too far um even in that case there, he doesn't shoot out those tires until he actively sees them kill someone. It's like, no, 100%, now you've got to be stopped because you're going to do more damage if I don't stop, if I don't blow up the tires now. Um, well, I guess he did that... Well, he did give that vagrant like a second chance where he could have easily just been like fined or isolation cube. Yep. Um, he could have shot those kids and he yep. just stunned them. Yep. And even the the crowd when before the med bay he gets in the same warning um throughout the whole thing he is almost always giving people the chance first um one of the the things that entered my mind um as i was looking through uh, like the tv tropes article on it it's like the the film has overall has a big like even though he he is the law there's a 
big difference between justice and law. And you see stuff like that. So technically that vagrant was breaking the law. It wouldn't have been just for him to just take him in. You see that with Techie as well, right? Technically by the law, yeah, you know, uh, Techie should be, should be taken in as well, but that's not justice. Mm. Right. Um, so and again, I think it's, I can definitely see what you're saying, though, but you have to be brutal in this world. I mean, we see what this one building is like. As I said, they get, what, 17,000 calls a day. They can respond to maybe 6% of them. And the judges have, like, a 20% mortality on the first day. Like, it is not a nice world. It is harsh. I think Dredd even says um, when uh, the chief justice is saying... Uh, Saying to him that he's taking Anderson out and throwing her in the deep end, it's like it's all the deep end. So I think what distinguishes him from the criminals is that bit of restraint. Mm. You won't kill someone on 99% sure of guilt, right? He said that to Anderson with, um, with K, I believe the character's name was, right? So, I mean, you contrast that to Mama. She is instantly... She she doesn't have a problem with being brutal, right? Oh, I love that she, character too. Yeah, the only time she showed mercy was two K. Was yeah, it was two K. But that's because she already lost enough people today. That's really the only reason she let them live at all. And you, you believe so, it? It's not like her showing leniency for emotion's sake. It's her being like, legitimately, I've lost like over a dozen people. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I'm going to pivot with this here for a second while we're talking about the characters. I love how similar Dread and Mama actually are. Mm. They are very similar across the board. They're both the pragmatic, um, for the most part, in control. Um, both very rage-filled. I mean, they even call it out. It's like, you're a real piece of work, Dread. And again, so am I. Like, mm. you can... I really enjoyed that how they both had that same anger, both had that same viciousness, right? The difference being Judge Dredd uh, directed it better. Okay. Well, I see. I mean, it could it could be framed in that way, but you could also say directed towards more lawful things. If you if yes. you think about the term of success, then Mama directed it more efficiently yeah. um, into yeah. a criminal that, uh, empire. Uh, but... Yeah, I did mean the directing it in a, <laughs> in a yeah, no doubt. I, I did mean more into the directing it in a more productive, like a, no, productive isn't the right word, um, socially acceptable way. Well, I mean, like, uh, how? What else are you going? Is, is as far as Mama goes, like, who? What else do you think the end result would have been for someone who's not only been, uh like a queen in the 300 or like yeah. the spartan queen but also yeah. from game of thrones right yeah oh yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah I, is amazing <laughs> I, I definitely i definitely enjoyed headley in this film um what what i liked about our Hedy Hedy specifically um well the character mama because eddie can pull it off she's she is a great actress um but the character herself like that commanding presence yeah for instance um like she was deranged she was driven unpredictable and she would it was obvious that she'd do anything for power yeah but that was subtly expressed to you mm -hmm. like she had maybe 10 lines and you knew all that just from one sentence sort of thing. Yeah. Um, like everyone under her, totally loyal. And you didn't know if it was out of some like longstanding loyalty or if it was just by fear. Yeah. Like the, the feeling that I got when she would enter the room is like the people under her were like metaphorically bowing to her. And yeah. she didn't even have to like make any visual um movement like she could be still yeah well and again it, i tie that to the, um the foils like the the mirror reflections between the two mm. because you see the same thing with dread like 
you don't see him with a bunch of underlings. But again, when those corrupt judges come in, right, and and they're bartering for the press, like, trust me, we know who this is. Trust me, this is <laughs> right. He's got that same reputation, that same um, command. I mean, even when he's shot and wounded, the guy is going like, "Why are you asking me to wait? Oh, look at the big judge dread." Yeah. Right. Um, begging. So it's he's got that too, and you see the same thing. Like, it's you could tell dread had that thousand thousand yard stare. Mm. Even though you couldn't, you never saw his eyes, but you could tell that he had, would have would have the same types of glares that Mama was having with her underlings, yeah. right? When Anderson didn't do something, when Anderson did something that he didn't necessarily agree with, or something like that. Was well, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that like thousand George stare because I had seen something while I was doing some like post watch research that like a stagehand or something had done something or said something inappropriate, and Carl Urban gave the dread stare to this person and like seconds later they apologized and he was wearing yeah. a helmet and everything yeah um hey. i analyzing the character of dread himself was difficult for me okay like i couldn't get past the chin acting mm. it was definitely some like i i really did get a stallone feeling from it yeah but it it definitely wasn't like like urban trying to be S stallone yeah like i think they were both trying to be this character mm -hmm. and to be honest if i were to judge the two i think urban did it better um right. but that might be because stallone has a very like he's very typecast still right. a stallone character is a stallone character you definitely don't see that with urban <laughs> no I mean, this is the same guy who played scotty <laughs> yeah but he, he played um I didn't even know. Scotty? No, not Scotty. Um, no, it was Bones. Oh, Bones, yeah. He played Bones and Billy Butcher from The Boys. Yeah. And I was like, excuse me. Yeah. Um, like it's really interesting. It's amazing. Um, I think some of it might have to do with the source material as well. Like, I I get the impression from the the research that I was doing that Urban was more familiar with the source material. Mm. Right. So like to the point that he's he's saying it's like, no, you will not see my face in this film at all. That's a big thing in the comics. Well, I mean, um, like he even he even drove the lawmaster motorbike himself. Yeah. Like yeah. it's it's interesting and this is just kind of like a side note. Um it's really interesting when you're watching a film and the actor or actress says, I'm a fan of this. Mm -hmm. And you can be like you can look at someone like say Carl Urban, it's like, okay, you actually understand the source material. Or even um, uh, Ryan Reynolds and Deadpool. You can be yeah. like, okay, you understand the source material. Yeah. But I'm not going to call anyone else when they say, or call out anyone, but when they say, yeah, I'm a, fa a fan of, you know, uh, this or that, and it comes in, it's like, you read one comic once? Or yeah. you, looked, you looked at the Wikipedia before you stepped onto the film set? To like, you yeah. can tell sometimes and i did not get that feeling with um uh carl urban up I, yeah no i didn't get that I, I agree with you um and yeah yeah you get that so often where it's like people say they're a fan and then you'll get or you'll have people who go okay this is the story i want to tell and there's a couple of actors who are fans and they're like nope this isn't how the character would be i, I remember um in specific, I'm referencing X Men there, because mm. both Halle Berry and um, Hugh Jackman knew their characters, right? So both of them were constantly playing with the script to make sure that the characters were what they would be. Mm. Right? And I mean, th and those are two iconic characters. So I'm glad those yeah. both Halle Berry and Hugh Jackman got those parts. Yeah, because like. I know this is a side and not the film that we're actually yeah. discussing um, today, but um, I, I'm really glad that they ended up with that because them, you know, throwing in like Hugh Jackman's throwing Bub in after everything to the point where they had to leave some in. Like, yeah. That's important. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess back to my original point, it was hard for me to analyze Dread. Like I saw him more how a citizen would in that world. As in cold, statuesque, um, 
unblinking like a force something that yeah. moves through an area um like the stare that you know is occurring but you yeah. can't do anything to avoid it yeah uh, even though you can't see his eyes you know that he's watching like that's yeah. that's how i felt and that's probably why i missed this um the mirror the foil between mama and dread yeah because um this is your first time watching it was mm. when you watched it last night for this right okay yeah so i've watched this movie probably a dozen times oh, okay like i i really enjoy this movie um so um and i think that's what they're trying to do i mean you know you know who dread is i think you it's not like to immediately analyze the character you're getting the main things that you want to see right that cold efficient calculating right but as you go through more repeated viewings of it i find it's you start to see the humor and humanity that is there as well mm. uh, so um again uh I, I look at things like when they're in the elevator right after the captured k and just like he's thinking of going for your gun yep he changes his mind yep <laughs> right? it, it's those little things and it's it's again it's that subtlety well, I did have a chuckle there. I had a, yeah. I definitely had a chuckle yeah. there. But he does that several times throughout the film, though, those same types of things. And um, when I'm talking about the one liners, uh, like the obvious ones are things like, nope, it's split three ways. Two now. <laughs> <laughs> He's fighting the corrupt judges, right? So, and when you think about it, you're, you're talking about someone who's cold and calculating, which is what you see. Think of all the times when he wasn't. I mean, technically, you had the the medic uh, refusing to help the judge which you know is kind of against the law but he's like nope i get it we're finding somewhere else because again it's that justice versus law and you have that little bit of of room um the approving smile at the end of the film when uh anderson mm. you know anderson's like nope it doesn't matter i've already lost my i've already failed but i'm in charge now still yeah so i'm letting him go right and you just see that like like literally the only time you see him get kind of anywhere close to a smile oh you know what that's that okay you're you're you've enlightened this calls back to something you said earlier and that's the difference between law and justice that the thing that she took that step would have been justice opposed to what that he what he was testing her saying he was testing her on which was law what he was yeah. actually looking for in character in um anderson was justice yeah so this this like i just had a light bulb mo uh, light bulb moment um when it comes to anderson yeah so i'm going to tell you my original perception of right. anderson from like start to finish in this film i did not get any semblance of character growth what i felt i saw was someone who was capable like they say that she failed but they also said that she failed by only a few points yeah so she was almost a dread which um judge dread the character judge yeah <laughs> it's been a long day yeah <laughs> oh, thank you for the correction yeah. though um yeah. <laughs> um almost a judge um so she has skills she knows what to do she was correctly giving all the lawful answers for every um situation she was being tested on yeah um it wasn't until she was alone and she wasn't being babysat anymore like handheld by judge dread that she was actually able to open up use her skills and use her abilities to their full extent mm -hmm. what you just enlightened me to was the what her growth actually was what i believe it to be now which was going from that book smarts to that street smarts rather going from what is lawful to what is just yeah yeah no definitely it, it's the being thrown in starting to experience and i mean you see that right from the beginning like she's so hesitant to to kill that the one guy right at the beginning but you know she starts to see okay no this is what it is and and learns to fight and gains her confidence gains her ability to fight back right um i think you really see the shift in her like speaking of when she gets to be herself and her own abilities um for me the big part where you see her shift 
is when she's playing mind games with Kay. Yeah, I noted that as it, well. The um the psychic combat where she was yeah. put into a a realm that was purely under her control. Mm-hmm. Where she, so I still I still think she had those skills and had all those abilities. Yeah. I don't. She didn't have the confidence. I, I'm not I, sold on the confidence reason. I think, again, I've only seen it the once, but I think it was underplayed. Yeah. Um, I think it was her being handheld by Judge Dredd wasn't her being in control of a situation. Mm. She was more of a tag along. Yeah. When she was finally alone, it was more that she took control rather than gained confidence itself. That's fair. Like, no, I think that interpretation better. Like, she could shoot, she can fight. Um, I mean, it might be a semantic game in the long run. Yeah. But, that, I mean, that's just my per- perception on it. But I, it's really interesting that you saw that, like, that same note. Yeah. And one thing what I really liked, and that it played up and it accentuated that entire thing. Like, I guess I'll need to explain my next point here. Right. Um, the the story is about Anderson. Yes, it's um, dread is merely a vehicle to uh, to push the plot forward and be a mirror to the villain. So you have Anderson in the middle. Yes. So I I think that would be the best way to state it that you would agree on. Um, I I'll have to I'll definitely watch this again. I mean, yeah. it it is a a good film in my opinion. Um. But this de- film was definitely about Anderson. One thing that I really liked that they did visually, and this came down to shots, um, directing, was the way that they shot Anderson. This kind of goes back to shooting her with the harsh angles all around. Right. Um, showing her the hard environment that she's in. Whenever it's a close-up with her in dread, it's always his face unmoving, yeah. cold, staring at her. And then they would shoot her in such a way that her features would seem softer and rounder. Yes. And I think that was to take your mind off the fact that she has capabilities. Like she almost became a judge simply from the test scores itself. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. I'm saying that, but because I don't know much about the rules, I don't know if like these are the best of the best or anything like that. Or if yeah. these are just like they churn them through because the fatality rate is so high is a possibility. But yeah. I'm assuming based on my co- the the context that I'm giving is I they're people with capabilities. Yeah, um, most of them seem competent. Yeah, even like throughout. Um, just speaking a little bit with Dread and Anderson's interactions there. Um, just kind of again one of those subtle things where you're talking about the the taking control for Anderson in particular. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if you noticed this much, but Anderson was always leading until the situation became dangerous. Mm. And then Dread was always in front, Anderson behind. So it's that, so again, when she's alone, yeah, she takes control. And I mean, even that, that mind seems like, no, we don't, you don't need to torture him. I can do this. It's that first time that she steps into the front, right? Because she realizes what she can do. So yeah, I think that it's such a subtle thing. And again, it goes to show, yeah, she's good. So all of a sudden she does look ready at the end. Where, and it again goes back to show that Dread isn't as cold as it seems. Throwing in the deep end, but he's still her trainee. Or she's still his trainee. <laughs> yeah. True, right? true. And, and you see that protectiveness, but it's... I think, again, it's subtle enough that you're not necessarily going to see it, that, that he's doing it all the time. What's, what's interesting is he did seem to have at least some type of innate trust in her. Mm-hmm. The fact that they had this potentially high-profile criminal in tow, and he just trusted this high-profile, um, likely very dangerous criminal to the training. Yeah. Like, legitimately, she was the one moving them around for the majority of the film until the um until they got jumped yeah but i that was in my opinion because of hesitation because she had not yet taken control yeah um the something i didn't like about the film was 
if there was going to be a sequel, which sadly there will not be. Um, there may be a series. Well, hopefully, because yeah. I didn't like the psychic bit. It To me, it as far as the story paces that occurred, um, they are pushed along by either Dread or the actions of Mama. Okay. Um, it, it was almost like um, the psychic abilities were some deus ex machina, just like um, just a shortcut for her to do things. Like, um, all right. Um, oh, she can do this thing because her mind is in a special way. Like, I'm, I'm not one to say they should change something about a film, but I just wasn't sold on the whole psychic bit. Um, I, I, and it led to a, a, one of my favorite moments, which I'm just going to say, and we'll get back into me complaining about dumb things. Um, <laughs> the, the whole, like, you're not wearing your helmet. Yeah. Um, oh, it interferes with my, you know, my psychic mojo. I actually had a moment where they were standing there before that, like three seconds before they said, I'm like, why didn't she bring her damn helmet? This is a, like yeah. a potentially dangerous situation. And then Dread goes, you didn't, you didn't bring your helmet. <laughs> yeah. I don't like, so, oh. <laughs> so, um, I didn't mind the psychic stuff too much. I don't think it was, I don't think it was overused. I think it feels odd because we don't have any other examples of psychics. Like which I think is context is in the universe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So the only context we have is this is rare and such like that. Um, some, yeah, the, the helmet thing, I think the big thing I would have liked to see there is that at the very least, like clearly, you know, we don't want to kill her off, but like, even if, you know, a grazing shot on the cheek or something, this goes, yeah, that helmet probably might've helped, right. Just to, to kind of play that danger. But I found, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with it being Deus Ex. Um, the big times when you see her using her psychic abilities, she's you see her kind of stopping and concentrating most of the time. It's not like it's a, a spider sense always on. I can read everyone's mind. Um, in fact, that's and it's probably why Kay managed to get the jump on the psychic was because mm -hmm. let's face it, she was focused elsewhere, right? True. But when she goes into the that family's the house, right, calls out Kathy, right, let, let us in. Um, you stop and you see her concentrating on it. What's interesting, and, I'm glad you brought that up because that just goes back to the whole her taking control. Because whenever she did, it had very positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. So when they were in a situation where it was like fight or flight, actually, I wouldn't even call it flight, I'd call it fight or strategy. Yeah. Um, in, in the context of that hallway scene um, when she was just like, you know, brain power, you know, open up, Kathy. Like, she straight up took control, led into that room. So, yeah, like, I, every time, with every situation now, I'm seeing it in this, this thing that you stated before, which was um, when violence was about to occur, Dread was the lead. When um, an alternative to violence... Um, or violence has not yet occurred. She was in the lead. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Again, it's in, yeah. I said it, it, it's subtle things that. I mean, I don't think I caught half this stuff on the first couple viewings of the film. Right? Well, that's, any any decent movie is going to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, a little bit of behind the scenes. Like I have like three times the notes that I had for our Silent Hill one, and it's because. I knew some of these things. And again, I know when we talked about like the foreshadowing and stuff like that, it's like, I had so many notes and they're all over the place because I'm like, holy crap, how all of this stuff connects throughout the entire film. Like what's I like it. It made me think about like, it's not something I would do when just enjoyably watching a movie to watch a movie. Yeah. Um, but taking notes made me notice something in this film that i wouldn't have noticed otherwise all right and it's how it's framed i think i the way i feel this movie is structured mm. is intro first half second half outro yeah so you have your super trope tropey super predictable vocal i'm i'm a badass um intro overlay over the sprawling city yeah uh into an inter introduction of the characters that's your intro you then have 
bodies hit the pavement after they've thrown been thrown out the window. Yeah. From there, and I, this is something I wanted to expressly bring up too. Um, from there to the middle of the foot, the film, you had Anderson and Dredd on the defensive running. Yep. We then have the middle part. Dredd throws a man uh, off the building. It's the yep. pavement. That's pretty much in the middle of the movie. And then from there, we have the change. We have um, Anderson take control. You have yep. um, Anderson and Dredd uh, start being more on the offensive. Yeah. Um, Dredd goes, becomes that like constantly moving, unstoppable creature that you would assume uh, that he would be. Yeah. Then you have the end preceding the outro, and that is Mama getting thrown off the building and hitting the pavement. Yeah. So, and then your outro, your sunset walk off, your which is the like pretty much she'll be a great judge. Um, and then your Sun, super, yeah, sunrise one. That's actually something I like. Because mm. if you think about it, actually, just it ties into exactly what you're saying. You have the beginning scene where they're basically going to this place first thing in you know, first thing in the morning. That middle, it's midnight, mm. and they come out in the morning. True. I, I, I just, again, I really liked that. <laughs> I, I just, I super appreciate this like book ending they did, and they did it all with throwing people off a freaking building. <laughs> Oh, with your man. divider in the middle of someone being thrown right off a building. Yeah, I, it, I, I've got. To, I'm looking over my notes here because there, there was several things like that. There was that bookend, um, so much bookends throughout the entire thing. You have the bookends of, uh, um, are you ready? Yes. You don't look ready. Bookend to the, are you ready? Yes. I, you look ready. Mm. Um, you, you have that, um. Like a setup, and then a, a definite payoff. Like yeah. the first time you see Mama, it's in slow mo. First and last time you see her, it's in slow mo to the same music. And honestly, beautiful shots. Oh yeah, beautiful shots. Um, quick note: I saw something that the the slow the slow mo music is a Justin Bieber song slowed down like eight hundred times or something like that. <laughs> I, I'm like. I... I mean, did it better than Inception. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, I saw that. That was, that was crazy. It blew my mind. I, I love those you... slow-mo moments. Uh, oh. Like, without going into an explanation, the way that it made me feel watching it was the, visually they were able to perfectly express like the what the user was feeling. Like, you could tell that they were feeling some type of, like divine feeling like divinity and various sereneness that like almost even mystical and that was from the color choices the sparkling um and of course like the water in the air yeah even see it with um mama as she's falling like the way she throws her arms back i'm like i i just have that impression of like uh, like wings almost like to go to that divine feeling mm. right i i mean the the swan dive type, type well, just of, um, i i i thought they were gonna do it in a the same manner they did in the first bodies they're being thrown off shot mm. which is divinity into brutality mm -hmm. i'm glad that they mixed it up by going like full sereneness even into her face being crushed like visually as you see it coming towards you I'm glad they made that choice, even though I don't like gore shots. Yeah. It was a choice I would have made. Yeah. And, you know, just, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to pepper this through a bit. Um, yeah. Just and going back to the foils. Um, again, subtle. When her face hits the, hits the floor, it, the, the pattern that her face splits in mm. matches the helmet. Oh. I didn't know I catch that. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, well, it's it's throughout. Like this film. Um, I mean, bookends. Like everything about this film, it is so well written in my mind. Um, other bookends that are throughout the film, in a lot of ways, uh, techie. Yeah. You like you, you see him right at the beginning with getting the eyes, um, his eyes gauged, um, plucked out by Mama, mm. and. Right at the end, when you see him, you know you're getting that 
Anderson is seeing that same thing. Um, so it's like, no, this is a victim, right? Um, uh, I mean, bookends for characters in in between. You know, you have the um, the medic trying, you know, trying to be as helpful as he can to the judge. And unfortunately, that gets him killed yeah. when he tries to help the judges again, right? Um, and again, everything in this. Well, there was place. a definite resolution to each character. Yeah. Um, the only, the only of like the primary characters um, that didn't have some type of end or resolution in the story would would be um, Dread, and that's because that's not the entirety of his story. That's just a segment of what it is in Dread, and that's why I call yeah. him the vehicle of the film. Yeah, yeah. This is just a day in the life for Dread. Yeah, like this wasn't. It, like this wasn't out of the ordinary for him. I think that's why you see that stoicism. I mean, even it's like when he's talking to the to the chief justice at the end, it's like, so what happened in there? Drug bust? Yeah, perps were uncooperative, right? Like, oh, yeah. just get that impression that it's just, and that th those are kind of the one liners that I was talking about with mm. dread. Like, there's stuff like that peppered in. It's fucking hilarious, <laughs> right? But it perfectly matches the tone, and it, it comes from his stoicism that makes it funny um i think that's that's something that they did really good like it was it, going back to the writing and the directing choices like it really made me focus focus on anderson as the primary character the main character um to the point where i didn't notice many of these things from um dread yeah um i mean you you can't not notice mama yeah like <laughs> The, the trio of these characters, like, perfectly cast. Um, they all did their job so well. Yeah. All were very believable. Um, I, I think so, especially with the, that chin acting. I mean, overall, out of all of them, I'd, them in the film, with the way it turns, I'd probably give this one nine I am thes out of 12 laws. <laughs> yeah, no, I was thinking I was going to give it a... Um, you know, five out of six bodies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like, I this is this is an it's it's an action movie it's a blockbuster. I know it didn't do near as well in theaters as I wish it would have, because again, it's amazing. And there's so many things like, I mean, I don't see plot holes and something like this and i think part of it's they kept it simple but again go back to how they've tied everything in like they there's the check off guns throughout the beginning um that honestly i didn't even notice even till like i was watching again last night I'm like ah oh, crap um little things like the id check on the gun when dread's getting ready right at the beginning of the movie mm. right which of course comes up later for uh for k when he takes anderson's gun um you have um the skate park being shown the um making sure you don't get taken alive um the rules that are laid out for what fails i think anderson breaks all of pretty much all of them yeah weapon taken um incorrect sentencing hostage yeah. Uh, escape yeah it's true right but i mean like, she learned what the difference between justice and law yeah oh exactly right but it's just the the fact that they're mentioned there right um there's i don't think there's a wasted shot in this film i don't think there's a wasted story beat in this film um everything from the guy that anderson kills um at first right being the the husband of the person who saves them in, in that first hallway scene being kathy's husband you know, I wonder if that's a result of um, the comic writers being involved in the script writing process, because the, they were credited as writers, and then there was screen by screenplay by um, Alex Garland. Yeah, Al Alex Garland. So what I'm wondering, comic and visual novel writers have to do it in a very specific way because yeah. of real estate, um, yeah. like page real estate. You. You can't have empty space 
something has to be pushing along. Yeah. Um, except in the situations of action, and then that real estate is controlled by the artist, in this case, the director. So yeah. I think that's why I get the comic book feeling, but in a very positive way from that. Yeah. And that would explain to me why there was no wasted shot. And I kind of mentioned this before, and this kind of kind of goes into this right now. There wasn't actually that much action in this movie. No. Um, the action beats definitely occurred, but they were, aside from the Gatling gun scene, they were quick, efficient, took seconds, exactly how you'd expect, like, you know, two people with guns who are about to shoot each other, what would actually be? Yeah. Like, how that situation would actually play out. Um, the rest was stories, and um, I don't know if it's the right terminology to say book ending the way that we have been, but the way that they do that with the characters that that beginning and then finally end a resolution that bookends each character that is yeah. important to the plot yeah no that's yeah the, the comic aspect of it especially when they are that involved that that actually does make a lot of sense for for how tight it is um i i just always find it refreshing when i see that like, i think I, I have just notes of these story beats how everything i'm probably i'm probably gonna have to watch it again um we'll get get a copy of your notes and take a read <laughs> and then uh watch it again just for kicks because like um it's it's i it's interesting that how like every point i've brought up you were able to enlighten me upon or expand upon um whereas something where we're both very familiar with the silent hill yeah. We came to, we noticed similar points, but had different conclusions. Yeah. This was more like you, when you say something, you're expanding upon it, which I really like. Almost like a, a guide. This this film itself was definitely very, had that feeling of that action gun movie. Like, I going into it, I got exactly what I wanted. Mm -hmm. If I could have anything more, it would probably be more of a, slightly extended fist fight maybe mm. another 15 20 seconds because it was mostly gunplay but that's from an action standpoint this definitely came off as an action movie and it definitely had that feeling where you could have your willis or your stallone or your schwarzenegger in it and it would feel right because of how well it was able to do the homage yeah the, the thing i i actually found myself reveling in all the tropes mm that were in this and how predictable it was yeah um for instance if this was more of a less of a i don't know if you could call it a throwback film but if it was less of a throwback film and the dirty judges showed up i would have been yeah. you know popcorn thrown at the screen oh what the heck but in this yeah. one i actually yelled yes dirty judges yeah because like i was i was stoked because i was like i know how how good dread is how is how is he going to take on or judges. Yeah. And it, I love that. What do you do in an emergency? Call 911. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. Um, the movie, you're right. It, this movie is a good example of tropes aren't, tropes don't mean bad. Mm. And a lot of people think that. You hear, oh, it's tropey. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with being tropey. Because you're right. Um, it's honestly one of the things, um, again, a little background behind the scenes stuff. Um, we after we watch the film, we we'll both kind of do a bunch of research, IMDb, uh, TV tropes, that type of thing. And I'm looking at it, it's like, yeah, there were, yeah, I, I can't really pull anything from this because again, it's just tropey. You know that, but they weave it together so well, and they avert the right tropes when they need to. Mm. Um, like, um. I'm not so upset about there not really being a larger fist fight in there mm. because this isn't the type of situation where you can have a fist fight. True. That's right. That's probably just me and like my power yeah. fantasy um, yeah. when it comes to these things. Like he's badass with a gun and he makes yeah. all, all these good choices. Like how is he going to do fisticuffs? Well, I mean, like it's a curiosity. The, he did crush the judge's trachea pretty handedly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that was... <laughs> That was him dominating. Mm. I I like that. Like I'm on equal footing 
I was I was hoping that Anderson was going to have that moment. Like this is me tropes might not or tropes doesn't mean bad. It had me hoping for a Anderson versus Mama fist fight. Mm. Like a la the end of say the hunt or like just two <laughs> BA chicks like yeah. totally getting down like I yeah. I don't know I I can see what you mean. Um, it might I have think, taken away from the film. I'll give it that. Yeah. I, I think this is where I'm saying it's like, I think they knew when to avert the tropes. Mm. When it, right? Um, so let's use, we'll use Anderson mm. for, for this example here. So Anderson very easily shows she's a capable fighter. Yep. She's, you know, cuffed, has her gun taken away, kicks the shit out of a few people. <laughs> Frees herself, you know, she she's got, gets her badass chick moment. Yeah. Right. And they definitely do the designated girl fight. They set up the designated girl fight with um the other judge. Right. And it's like, oh yeah, no, here's how it's gonna go. I'm gonna shoot you. I'm gonna shoot her if I see her first. If if she sees me first, she hesitates, then I shoot her. Because she didn't know and that fight gets averted because I don't know, maybe it's a fucking psychic and you have murderous intent that's just glaring. That's that's the one moment in it that I really enjoyed the use of the psychic abilities. Like yeah. how how fast that fight was over. Yeah. Like it was um straight up like them approaching and I was like Ugh! and then she was just like nope and yeah. takes her out with a single burst and I'm like which is coincidentally when I realized like it had been like ruminating in my head the the concept that she was capable the whole time already yeah. because it just seems logical that she would be if she was in that position um but when she straight up mercs mercs the judge i was i was like yep yeah, yeah i ex yeah. expected that because she's capable right yeah. the which is interesting i know took out one one judge from behind but her and Dread took out the same amount of judges. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but I, I think I knew how capable she was as soon as she took control in the film. I do like the fact that they averted the girl-on-girl -girl fight. Yeah. Um, that being said, I, Mama would have been like a great opponent. Yeah, but. It but it couldn't have happened. No, I, I agree. Right, because right. again, th this goes back to the, you see exactly how much of a foil Dread and Mama are when you pay attention. It's like, no, it had to be them. Right, because they're, they're two sides of the same coin. Anderson would have been out of place to be the one uh, fighting there. Yeah, agreed. Right, right. so, hey, uh, go ahead. There, there, there was one major trope some people think it's might be a bad thing, but I would have loved it. Where where was my Stallone cameo? <laughs> and if they purposefully avoided it, I am upset. Like I I would love that. Like if if he was the paramedic or um like a judge just walking past. Like, I would have absolutely loved it. Yeah. Cameos, I think, are hard are hard to do. Like, I, I get where you're, where you're going with that. I, I can't see a way of that happening in my head without it pulling me from the film. Mm. Right? The, sorry, I can think of a single way, right? And it, it would be in the same way that um, Daniel Craig was cameoed in The Force Awakens. He was a stormtrooper mm. who was questioning a character, right? So you wouldn't, like, you know, so if it was a judge that you'd never see him take the helmet off, right? But you, you just kind of hear the voice, right? That would be, but anything else I think would, would pull me from the film. I guess, it, like, something subtle that you wouldn't notice till the third watch. But yeah. I wanted it, and yeah. this this film made me because of the tropes it made me crave that style of movie and now i honestly i i would love if like 
if there was a translation of say demolition man oh like i would i would love i would love to see that, like alex garland make a version like a yeah. up-to-date version of demolition man granted no i th i think it would hold i think it would i i think demolition man holds up <laughs> I, I really do um it, it's good well it's just that style <laughs> of movie and like the the shot choices just reminded me of so many things like when they introduced the skate park yeah it, i instantly had this feeling of the hackers arcade scene oh yes yeah like, you're right and i was just like wait a minute and that's when like a positive level of nostalgia and i'm not one for nostalgia like yeah. some guy playing super mario 3 i'm just like whatever yeah pass but that kind of like shot nostalgia that reminds me of something i enjoyed without just being like hey it's super mario mm. um that's my jam yeah oh yeah because it, it, you're right it really does and, and i think it's action films have become so, something so different nowadays right i mean they're more thrillers right mm. your your action movies of today are your born mm recent born you have that i mean another film that kind of does that same thing is like in john wick and i've mentioned that a few times like i watched john wick and i just go this is like a serious uh version of shoot 'em up this is amazing <laughs> right like uh and you're right it kind of hits that same thing um again i think is right they they knew how to use the tropes well so nothing really came as a surprise and that's not a bad thing um well, I just I disagree there. They they had those tropey setups and then they um overted your expectation. So like the like the expected BA girl fight yeah. that I mentioned before, like they set that up and then over in a split second you yeah. expected the uh judge fight to take out an entire level. Yeah. Um but to be honest, uh dread was fully on the negative side, negative end of that. Like, yeah, it was definitely not leading, or w is what you would expect him to be doing. Yeah, no, that's that's fair. Um, yeah, it's just, again, it's like I guess I meant the, like the more major beats. Oh, the major beats. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because again, they knew where to avert the tropes mm. when they needed to, right? And that, so it never feels. You never get that eighties camp feel. For sure. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, just a couple of tropes that I that I noted here that they avert it. Um, like speaking of '80s films, uh, the way they actually handled the guns for the entire thing. Um, again, subtle, but the judges all have insane. Like they they follow gun safety throughout the entire thing when they are not ready to shoot their fingers are off the trigger the weapons are down nowhere near aimed at anyone um they immediately note that they have to pay attention to the ammo mm. um right and conserve you know they're making sure their shots count they never um heck even when they had machine guns right they had it so it's not like she had unlimited ammo because she couldn't shoot red when he came through that guy off the building yeah, because she was out of ammo. Like they, they, you wouldn't see that in in the '80s action movie in the same way. Um, yeah, just adding those the sense of realism is. I had that moment too, to that point where I was sitting there and, like, he was. There were several times they led up to it before he ran out of ammo. Yeah. Um, and it was obvious that he was like counting shots and counting clips and keeping a close eye on um how much ammo that he had left yeah. because he knew that was going to be his extent and of course you had some fall into his lap uh the uh, story beats but even then after that he used what um some off a couple off screen and then one for mama yeah um yeah, not much. And I mean, like, again, they immediately called out. As soon as it goes sideways, it's like, make your shots count. <laughs> right? Like, immediately says Danner's like, no, we don't have the opportunity. And you see them use things like, oh, it's a crowd, so 
Let's use a gas grenade. Let's use a stun grenade. Let's keep make it so we don't need to waste shots, right? Like, you know, let's go covert here because that's the only way we're getting through this, right? Um, yeah, there's a point that I had, and it totally doesn't connect to anything we're saying, so I'm just going to throw it out yeah, here. Yeah, just go for it. Um, one of the things you were talking about with um, with Anderson taking the lead, yeah, uh, just something to show kind of that character growth that happens again in the middle of the film, right? Like, it, it's in that middle of story beats. Like, okay, what are our options? It's like, oh, the same as before. We just now now know that we're getting help. And he's like, or we go on the offensive. It's like, you never entered her mind that, oh, we can take control. Yeah. Right. Oh, and that um, leads into the story points that I mentioned before. Yeah. So then I guess this movie really isn't like thirds. It's really halves. Yeah. I mean, s some film buff or film student will definitely be like, no, Drew, no, you're wrong. And I'll probably be like, <laughs> those are valid reasons as to why I am wrong. And here are the maybe not as valid reasons why I think I'm right. Because <laughs> I have humility. And that's what makes me awesome. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing. Is like, sure. I mean, you, I guess there's different ways you can break up the film. You could break it up into the three act structure, and you know, yeah, I can get that through. But I think, I think halves is more right. It, it definitely goes up from the story side, not necessarily the the tension and the action, but it, it goes up to that middle and then almost mirrors its way back down, right? Mm. Right, it's just now Anderson's the one taking control, and it's Mama getting thrown off the, the building, and yes, she's ready, right? And it'd be interesting to see it's like if you match the scenes up because, they, it, I know some movies do this where they actually do, mirror it, mm. and you could like actually mirror it. It'd be interesting to see it's like huh, I wonder what time points those things happen. <laughs> I, I, I bet you be similar. Weird. It's weird how the choices we expect. It's it definitely gave me the feeling that this is the film that they wanted to make. Mm. I didn't feel any anything wanting from the film, or there was a choice or a shot that didn't seem like it was the way that it's supposed to be. That could just be great editing. That could just be great choices. It might just be how well the writers and the screenplay writer worked yeah. worked together. But it didn't give me that that feeling where you wish something would be like, yeah. like I said, I, I would have enjoyed or liked there to be, you know, even a 15 or 20 second fist fight longer. Yeah. But again, that's only 15 or 20 seconds. I'm yeah. not asking for like, you know, some gently full action, five minutes, badass fight scene with fists, yeah. um, maybe like some type of handheld implement. No, just 15 seconds of like, yeah. um, and that's what I personally want. So I, I think that the, even though it's, it sounds like there was some drama in the, the directing side of things for this film, I think, um, they ended up with a product that would have been enjoyed. Yeah. The, and I, I did hear there was a little bit of drama around the directing as well. Like, I guess, like I mean, the editor did so much, was it? Was Alex Garland the writer? It was the and screenplay editor? and um, the editing well, right? director. I'm not sure about the editing. I know that the directing uh, directors often have a very um, close hand in the editing yeah. because. Yeah. But I I know that uh, Pete Travis uh, is credited as a director. However, there was like creative differences, so that he left and a tech technically. Uh, Alec Garland was the co-director. I came out with a joint statement saying it was an unorthodox collaboration or something like that. And yeah, given like the potential drama and like you don't know if this is PR of like, something that exploded and they're just you know saying something nice for the world to hear, or if it really is just a tame situation. But given the fact that there was obvious disagreements for, to have something that is so whole. So yeah. something that you can put in a box as a unique um, individual object yeah, um, that isn't really left wanting beyond what it is, they were able to accomplish it. Oh, very true. Yeah, I think, yeah, cause I, I know I saw some of the drama. I think I saw something um, 
I think Carl Urban came out a couple of years ago and said it's like no, basically Garland directed it as well. Mm. Like Pete Travis actually ended up being a lot more hands off of it mm. than they originally thought. I'm not sure. So I'm again, I'm not sure how much of that is drama, how much of that is creative differences, how much of it is the fact that Alex Garland never directed anything, so can he be the director? Um, well, it could also yeah. be like you you never know these things like um Pete Travis I hope or I hope this isn't the case but he might have had like a, a long standing family health issue or something. Yeah. So you you never know. Yeah. Um but I mean if this was primarily Alex Garland, great job. Yeah. Great yeah. job. Like um if there was friction and it was two directors it definitely didn't feel like it. Yeah. And you see that in a lot of times when you get that friction, you have multiple story writers or multiple directors, and he goes like, "I think I'm watching two different movies that they put together." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's it's unfortunate when both of the movies that were put together aren't very good, like Justice League. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I, I don't know if anyone um, knows this, but. We're, we're likely to be avoiding the majority of superhero things unless they're actually interesting. Yeah. Or, like, random one-offs. If it's... I I might not even watch another Iron Man movie, so I'm probably not going to have one on uh, Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> uh, mind you, I did like the ones I watched. I'll, I'll say that. I think overall, that's most of what I wanted to say about the film. Like, is it is complex in its simplicity, a lot of it was visual storytelling. Yes. Um, a lot of it goes back to things like I say, like having Anderson soft features next to um, Dredd's very like harsh, uh, cold features. A lot of the moments of silence expressing something. Yeah. Um, be that hesitation from Anderson, be that uh, a drop of music that I didn't even notice. That's probably why I was, I was even tricked. I would say, by the Dread character, yeah. where I didn't notice a lot of these because um, how misdirecting it was. It yeah. was always pushing my focus to Anderson. When it was when there was something violence, it was always pushing my focus to whoever was being assaulted or attacked. Yeah, well, I'm 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 really interested to to touch base on this. I don't know if it'd be another one-off recorders. I'm mean, I'm really interested to hear your take on this on a, after a second viewing. Yeah. The earmarked films for revisit. Just a sec. Give me a sec. Non sequitur. I ain't got one. Just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that yeah, that that's all I can say about the film. And I enjoyed it. It was good. Um, nine out of twelves. I am the laws. Uh, five out of six bodies. Was it? Body sitting the floor. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, yeah. This again, very, very good movies. It, it quickly became one of my favorites. I see why it's being called, um, becoming a cult classic. Well, for sure. Uh, it's a shame that this sequel has pretty much been stopped. But the fact that they are actively, like as of January, twenty twenty one, they are actively looking for streaming service to pick up. Uh, Judge Dredd Mega City 1, I think is what they called it. Give me yeah. a five episode hour and a half per or um, nine episode Japanese animated that's true to form. Mm. That's what I'd want. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. yeah. I know Carl. Carl Urban is definitely definitely on board with this. So, yeah. Of course, uh, check out um, you know anything with Carl Urban, Lena Headey. I mean, they're both amazing actors. I don't think Olivia uh, Thrillby uh, Anderson has been in quite as much that I recall. Oh, she um, she's actually been in a surprising amount, and it's like the weirdest mixtures. Oh, that's right, Juno. Yeah, she, well, she's in Juno. <laughs> she she was all over the place. She's um, she's been oh. Apparently, she's going to be Hero Brown in Why the Last Man, which is a great um, comic that everybody should check out. 
just a great story. Um, yeah. But she's been in romantic comedy. She's been in dread. Like she's action yeah. thriller. Um, yeah, she's all over the place. Yeah, yeah. darkest hour. Um, I haven't seen her in much else, but I definitely want to. <laughs> or rather, I guess I didn't recognize her in the same way that I do uh, Hetty and Urban. But no, definitely check them out. Yeah, Alec, do a screenplay for Demolition Man, please. Yes, I would be completely down for that. Um, and I think we're going to uh, wrap it up there. So again, check out our Beard and the Beasts dot com. All of our social media, all of the platforms that we're on are there. Like, share us. If you hate us, just uh, throw it to your enemies like you would Judge Red would throw them to the ground. Yep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I know we're still working out formats for what we'll be doing next time. Uh, we do want to get to the point where we'll kind of give you guys a heads up of what we'll be doing so you can enjoy the film before we put it out but we're still kind of working on the structure and figuring out exactly which ones we want to have out so uh, but we definitely want you guys involved so comments all that stuff yeah it's a media club let's have a club (laughs) yeah uh, expect um in the near future compared to when this is released um some type of submission form for films that you think we should um check out and please be kind We've already um, put enough terrible movies on this list to torture each other with. Please don't add for that. Um, if you're going to submit multiple movies, make it two good ones and one bad one, please. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, <laughs> we we look forward to uh, seeing you all at the next Beardy and the Beast uh, Media Club. Have a good one, guys. <laughs>